That was beautiful. Thank you. Well, my name is Ken Nichols, and I uh, hail originally from Mobile, Alabama. Hope, please don't hold that against me. Um, and right now I live in Arlington, Texas, so it is a pleasure to be here with you today. I will appropriate the words of Paul, who said, I have eagerly desired to preach the gospel to you who are here in Longview. It's one of my great joys is to share the gospel with unbelievers, but also to preach the gospel uh, consistently and faithfully to believers because it is the means by which we are grown up in the faith to, to remind one another constantly and continually what Christ has done for us. And uh, man, what a great day to do this. And uh, I am excited to be here with you. If you would, turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Titus, the book of Titus, a little bitty book of Titus. Um, it's right, uh, right at the end of Paul's letters. You've got uh, Philemon and then Hebrews, which may or may not be Paul's. We're not sure, but God in heaven knows. But we're going to look at Titus today, the little book of Titus. One of my uh, favorite little books of Titus, uh, well, the only little, little book of Titus, but one of my favorite little books uh, that Paul wrote because in it is so condensed so packed with good stuff, and it fits on two pages. So I can read the whole book and just keep going. You ought to see all my Bibles where Titus is done like that. I, I just, I just, I love this book, and I love being able to look at the whole book at the same time and just make notes and draw things, and it, oh, it's great. Studying, studying the Bible is good. It's good for you. Uh, make you big and strong. You should do it often. Uh, we're going to study this book together, and I want to ask you to to stand with me in honor of God's Word, and we're going to read chapter 2 together. We won't read the whole thing, but I want us to read chapter 2 together, because uh, it's such a, uh, just, it lends itself so well to, to congregation, because there's something in here for, a little bit for everyone, so uh, just join with me, and if you want to, um, well, I'm reading in the ESV, so if you'd like to read the ESV aloud with me, go, go ahead, otherwise just listen to God's Word. But as for you, He's Paul writing to Titus. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. That's the third time we've heard that, self-controlled. Urge the young, younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself, Titus, in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Then we come to our focus passage for this day. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That means now. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, Titus. Exhort these things, Titus. Rebuke with all authority, Titus. Let no one, let no one in the church, Titus. Let no one in the church disregard you. Let's pray. Father, we ask you for your help today. Um, God, that you, would, that you would cause us in your divine goodness, in your divine mercy, and in your divine grace to submit our hearts to this word today. To receive it as the gift that it is, wasn't written to us, but it's written for us, for our instruction. And we ask you, dear God, open our hearts, open our minds, and Lord, would you plant the seed of your word deep into our hearts. And Lord, would you prepare the soil of our hearts that it would be good, that it would receive, and Lord, that in due time it would bear fruit. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 
One of the reasons why today's passage is so important to me is um, it doesn't take long to look around at our, the landscape of our nation and the landscape of truly the church uh, in America and to see that uh, we, we have issues. A recent survey said that over 50% of people who claim the title, who self-identify as evangelical Christian, more than 50% of them do not attend church. If you were to go back 2,000 years and you asked that question, uh, I dare say you would have a hard time finding that similar percentage. The, the New Testament knows nothing of, of a professing Christian or someone who is allowed to call themselves a Christian that is not active in, in a church. As we're going to see today, one, one of the, the reasons, one of the methods, the primary method of which God grows and builds His kingdom is through the local church and the multiplication of local churches. It is the local church which is the most important entity on this earth for the advancement of God's kingdom, the local church. And as good as they are, it's not Christian schools. And as good as they are, it's not social, um, social programs. It's the local church. That's what God has designed to get his will done in this earth, to advance the kingdom, to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. It's, it's the local church. And ladies and gentlemen, God loves the local church. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ himself died for the local church. And we should, we should embrace that. We should, we, should, we, should, we should squeeze out every bit of that that we can and receive it for ourselves and live in it and walk in it. And as the scriptures tell us, to be zealous for good works. I just want to kind of draw your, 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 your eyes to the context here of what's going on. Um, we see this as a letter from Paul to a young man by the name of T Titus. He may not be young anymore, but Titus is a man who accompanied the apostle Paul. He accompanied the Apostle Paul for several years. Um, we know that, for instance, he was in the he attended the Jerusalem Council in the Book of Acts, Acts chapter fifteen, right? He attended that. He was there. Uh, it doesn't actually mention his name there in the Book of Acts, but later on, when when Paul is talking about that event in Galatians, he he he, he says, you know, uh, they even tried to circumcise Titus, but we resisted that. We we fought back against that foolishness. It's not necessary for a Christian to be circumcised. We fought back against that. So we know Titus was with Paul there in the Jerusalem Council, even though he wasn't mentioned in the book of Acts. He's mentioned later. We, we know that, that Titus um, was evidently trusted by Paul because we see here in verse 5 of chapter 1, we see he's, these words, This is why I left you in Crete, Titus so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So what we see here is this man Titus, who has been with Paul at some, for, at some length, um, who has been probably discipled by Paul. He's been trained up by Paul in this ministry of, of, of church planting that Paul has been involved in for, for, for decades at this point in time. Uh, this is probably one of the last letters that Paul wrote. Um, it's, it's newer uh, than Second Timothy, but older than First Timothy, so it's somewhere near the the end of his journey, um, and we know that Paul was at Crete at least once uh, in the Book of Acts when he was when they were well they were shipwrecked because they refused to stop and stay in Crete for a while, so they left Crete kind of early and then they got in, got in trouble. And anyway, you, you'll read that story if you want to at the end of Acts, but but Paul's ministry was to go to these areas to preach the gospel to unbelievers and those who began to believe to form them into local churches and to appoint elders, teachers, overseers over them to, to, to instruct them, to train them, to disciple them, to lead them. That was Paul's method to find unbelievers, preach the gospel that they would become believers, organize them into local churches under leadership that would teach them and train them. That's what God did. That's what God's doing. It's what God's always intended to do. It's not rocket science. It's a very simple concept. To put God's people under God's under shepherds so that they may, may be taught the word of God. So the result would be here 
in, chap, in uh, verse 14 of chapter 2 that we would be a, a people who are zealous. Zealous for good works. Uh, do, you, do you know what the word zealous means? Let me give you an example. You know those people, and this is, I've never done this, I don't like to take my shirt off in public, but you know those people that at football games, when it's like 12 degrees, and they're shirtless, and they're covered in their team's favorite colors? Ladies and gentlemen, that is zealous. Okay? Those people who love hunting so much that when it's like four degrees outside, they will get up at four in the morning, sneak out of the house without waking their kids and their wife so that they can go sit in the woods and freeze some more. Ladies and gentlemen, that is zealous. Oh, wives, you know what I'm talking about. When a man goes out and buys a beautiful, pretty, shiny bass boat, right? You know what I'm talking about? I don't. I don't have a bass boat. I'll gladly take one home to Arlington with me if somebody's trying to get rid of one. But I don't have one. But let me tell you what's zealous. Someone, I saw one today. Beautiful, shiny bass boat being towed by a beautiful, shiny truck. And no telling how, what time he got up this morning to, to go by bait. And no telling how much time he spends on his his reels, making sure his reels are clean and putting new line on them every spring. Ladies and gentlemen, that's zealous because they are, they are motivated by the idea of hunting or fishing or their team winning. They are on fire for that. That, that wakes them up. That gets them excited. That gets their blood flowing. Ladies and gentlemen, we are to be that way for the work of the Savior because it says here in chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus, he, he, he redeemed us from all lawlessness, from all sinfulness, from all acting as if God has no standard in this earth upon us. He, he did that to redeem us from that and to purify us, a people for his own possession who are zealous. Zealous. God wants zealous people. Now that may look different in different people. Some people are zealous quietly. But nonetheless, they're zealous. Some people are just outwardly, woo, zealous. Some people are kind of middle of the road. But God wants people who are zealous for good works. Jesus warned us in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you know, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, right? And he said, you know, let, let the world see your good works. And you know what the result of the world seeing your good works was to be? You remember that? So they glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let me tell you what Jesus wants for everyone sitting in this pew today. For you to be a person who is zealous to live in such a way, to, to, to attend such a church that the Lord God would see Calvary Baptist Church and that the people in the world around you in Longview would see Calvary Baptist Church sitting here on this corner and the people that pour out of here this afternoon and who head to work tomorrow and who head to school tomorrow, the, that the, the world would see those people and the way that you live your lives and the, the way that you use the things that God blesses you with, the way that you use your assets and your money and your time and your mouth and your influence and the way that you use those things and you live that because you are zealous for God to be glorified. That's what Jesus died to bring about. It's not just that you'll be happy and comfortable. No, no. Don't even worry about being happy and comfortable yet. That's coming. Because if your best life is today, boy, I'm sorry for you. My best life is to come. And I'm zealous for that. Because I'm trying to lay up treasure in heaven. Where no moth, no thief, no rust, no black mold, no flood, nothing's going to get to it because it's kept. It's kept by somebody who's a lot more trustworthy than the FDIC. <laughs> God got my bank. I'll get to the text here, I promise. Are we ready? So this is what we're after. We're after good works. And not, not to earn our salvation, 
This is important. It's not to earn our salvation. It's not to earn God's favor. But it's as a result of God's favor. Again, verse 14 is so key. It says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and then to purify us for himself, a, a people, a, for his own possession who are zealous. We're, we're, we're redeemed. We're purified. We're possessed. And out of the glory of all of that, that's when we just are just unleashed in our zeal to do good works that bring glory to the Father. I'll get off of verse 14, I promise. But it's just so good. You see why it's your memory verse this week? Did y'all notice that? I saw it on your website last night. I said, yes! That is great! Thank you to whoever put that up. That is awesome. It's a great memory verse, and you should. I can't command you. I have no authority over you, but I'm just going to say, I'm just going to encourage you. I'm going to exhort you. Memorize that verse. Let it sink into your heart. Let it wash over you. Because you, you, Calvary Baptist Church, you were redeemed so that he could purify you, so that he could possess you, so that you would be zealous, on fire, fanatical for the glory of God. It's not a bad thing to be a fanatic for the glory of God. It's not a bad thing at all. It may lead you to do stuff. It may lead you to give stuff. It may lead you to leave stuff, drop stuff. But if it's for the glory of God, it's okay. Be as nutty as you want to be, right? Let your freak flag fly. It doesn't matter. As long as it's for the... As long as it's for the glory of Jesus, for the glory of God the Father, be a zealot in your life. That doesn't mean be a kook. It means be a zealot for the glory of God, that you would be willing to lose anything, suffer anything, give anything, spend anything, that God would get the glory. It's a big difference. So look at verse 11. If that's the goal, to be zealots, people who are zealous for good works, let's look how, that, how we get there. Because I don't know about you, but I can't do this on my own. I can't do this on my own power and my own strength. Number one, because I'm a natural fat body who naturally likes to sit on the couch and read. I just, I don't like to, I don't like to get up and do much. I like to do what I got to do, and then I like to sit down and I like to read. So I have to be motivated. I have to be moved. I have, to, I, have to, I have to have that self-control thing that, that Paul was, was writing about here to Titus that, that he used to teach every member of the church, every group within the church, self-control. Teach them self-control because it's something that we need. We need self-control. And how do we get that? Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared. For the grace of God has appeared. I want to thank you for the way that you blended all of those songs together. That was great. And then how you brought us back to Amazing Grace, a song that I think most people in our country know, even if they don't know the person through whom that grace came, they know the words and the tune of that song. It's one of those things where we kind of use cultural artifacts in order to reach into the culture and present the gospel. Everybody knows that phraseology. They know those words. Thank you for, for bringing us back to the, that beautiful hymn. Written, by the way, if you ever studied that, by, by a former slave trader who came to see the sin in his life, repented of those things, and wrote that beautiful song. So that wretch that he's singing about, that he wrote about, he knew. He knew how the grace of God could come in and save a wretch like me. Like me, like you, he can save us. And he has, it says here, the grace of God has appeared. Y'all know who he's talking about, right? That's right. Jesus isn't just gracious. God doesn't just have grace and share grace and act in grace. Jesus is grace in the form of a person. Jesus is the grace of God personified. Jesus himself is the appearance of God's grace. 
God's grace has always been there. It's always been a part of who he is because he's an eternal God who does not change. He wasn't not graceful in the Old Testament and all of a sudden decided to be graceful in Matthew chapter 1. No, he was always a gracious God, full of grace and mercy and abounding in love, slow to anger and abounding in love as he revealed that to Moses. But the grace of God, oh, it has appeared. The grace of God has shown up in the person of Christ. Jesus Christ is God's grace personified. Look what happens. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, what this does not say, before we get into what it does say, this does not say that everybody is going to be saved. Otherwise, we wouldn't be necessary. But the fact that Christ appeared, the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation for all people, means that this message, if heard and believed, is good news. And is good news for everyone who believes. For older women, for older men. For younger women, for younger men. For the free and for the slave. For the, for the European, for the Asian. For the African, even if there was somebody on Antarctica. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Salvation has appeared and it's available for all people who will respond to the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. It's available. It has appeared, bringing salvation, making us savable. Salvation has arrived and his name is Jesus, but it doesn't mean that everyone is naturally saved just because he has shown up. Again, that would make the church absolutely unnecessary. But because everyone is not saved just by Jesus showing up, the church is absolutely necessary. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. So I think we've sung some beautiful songs today, some powerful songs about how salvation how, salve, how grace saves us. And that is great. What a great message. But I think a lot of times people leave it there. Oh, I'm so happy Jesus saved me. I'll see you next Easter. I'll see you at Christmas. Tithing? No, that's so Old Testament. I don't, I don't have to live a holy life. I'm saved by grace. But we forget the whole reason grace appeared. Grace appeared to bring salvation for all people, but it doesn't stop there. Even though our culture may stop there, it doesn't stop there. Look what Scripture says. It, it appeared bringing salvation for all people. Verse 12, training us. Training us. Who's the us? The ones who are saved. Grace has appeared bringing salvation to all people, and then training us, those who are saved by this saving grace, we also come to experience grace as a training grace, as a transforming grace, as such a force in my life that it changes every relationship that I had prior to my salvation. Salvation changes my relationship with God because, because once, once upon a time, I was, I was an object of God's wrath and justice. I was condemned in my sins. I deserved God's wrath because I had sinned against an infinite God. You know how I sinned against an infinite, infinite God? I lived as if he did not exist. Oh, I gave lip service to him. Oh yeah, I, I believe in God. But that kind of faith doesn't save. I was an object of God's mercy, of God's justice, of God's wrath, and if he had not saved me personally, if I were to die today, I would have spent eternity serving out my sentence for treason against a holy God, the creator of the universe. 
But it says, since I have, have been saved, I have experienced that saving grace. The same grace that saved me is now at work in me, training me. It's training me. It's changing me. So the relationship that I had to God has changed. The relationship that I had to sin has changed. I'm, I'm supposed to have a different relationship to my sin. Just like I now have a different relationship to God, I'm no longer under His justice, under His wrath. I'm now under His mercy. I'm under His grace. My relationship is now changed. I'm no longer an enemy of God. I'm a son of God, a child of God. Therefore, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That relationship has changed completely. My relationship with sin is supposed to change too. I'm no longer walking in it, embracing it. In fact, now in my life, I am at war with my sin. I hate my sin. The sin that is still residing in me, I hate it. And sometimes not enough. But I'm to have a changed relationship because of saving grace and then this training grace. Look what this training grace does. Verse 12, it trains us to renounce ungodliness. Do you know what that means? To renounce something? It's to give it the hand. You know what I'm saying? It's to, it's to, it's to disavow it. It's to reject it outright. It's to deny it. It's to turn your back on it. I am no longer living. I'm no longer committed to living a life as if God never existed. Instead, I am renouncing that life. Here's what happens. Becoming a Christian makes you intolerant. You know what it makes you intolerant of? Your own sin. We're not supposed to be intolerant of others. We're supposed to be intolerant of our own sin. We are not to tolerate sin in our lives. And if you understand that, you'll be a lot harder on yourself than you are on others. That makes you a legalist. Be hard on yourself and soft on others. Be compassionate to others. Help them to come to the grips through, through grace that they need to renounce their sin. They need to renounce their ungodliness. But your first job is to not tolerate ungodliness in your own heart. Renounce it. Disavow it. Reject it. That's what the grace that saved you is now training you today to do. And can I tell you, it doesn't say it only trains some Is training us. Not just missionaries, not just preachers, not just Sunday school teachers. To everyone to whom grace has come to save, grace has also come to train. Woo! You don't get on the football team and then get to skip practice. Right? You don't get to skip wind sprints. You don't get to skip weight room. You don't get to skip team meetings. Nah, brothers and sisters, when you're on the team, when grace comes and says, you're on the team. Get in the training room. We're going to do business. As they say, championships are won in the weight room. Long before the game ever started. Ladies and gentlemen, we are saved and we are being trained by the same grace, by the same spirit, by the same God. It's training us to renounce our ungodliness and our worldly passions. Another thing we're not to tolerate in our own hearts is our worldly passions our selfish ambition, our unforgiveness, our grudges. We are to renounce that stuff. We are to be at war with that stuff. We are to make war with the sin in our hearts. We are to be ex absolutely intolerant of any sin in our lives. You know why? Because sin rejects God, and I want to reject anything in my life that rejects God. It's called the double rejection. I just made that up. It's not called that. I just made that up. I want to reject anything that rejects God because I was once a rejecter of God and God saved me out of that by His grace from that and now He's training me to reject anything of that residing in my life and in my heart. I'm to reject anything that rejects God. The grace that saves me from my rejecting of God is now training me to reject anything in my life that rejects God. Wow. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had a church full of people who were at war with the sin in their own hearts. You know what would happen if you were to, you know, because it's going to happen. We're going to have, sometimes people in the church, they get on your, on your bad side, don't they? Not this church. Just those other churches. Sometimes people rub you wrong. Sometimes people upset you. Sometimes people make decisions that you're not happy with. 
But you know what? Sometimes people just flat out sin against you, right? They may say things to hurt you, but you know what? If they're truly at war with the sin in their hearts, and you go to them and say, hey, look, brother, uh, that thing you said in public that was supposed to be between me and you private, I shared that with you. Uh, you weren't supposed to share that. Guess what? If they're at war with sin in their hearts, and you bring that to them, you know what they'll do? They'll repent it. They'll confess it, and they'll repent of it. Because someone who is at war with sin in their own hearts will confess sin and they will repent of it. Because they believe, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So someone who's at war, who's renouncing sin, renouncing lawlessness, guess what, brothers? You want to be in the church with those people. You don't want to be in church with perfect people. Nah, that ain't no fun. You want to be in church with people who are confessing their sins. When they blow it, they confess it. That's who you want to be in church with. You know why? Because that's where Holy Spirit training camp's going on. Because the grace of God saved us and is training us. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And that's the negative. So it's training us to stop certain things, to say no to certain things. But then look, look how it goes on. To live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Woo! The grace that saved you, the grace that appeared in the person of Jesus Christ, saved you and is training you to say no to certain things, but he's also training you to embrace certain things. Your, again, your relationship with everything changes when grace comes to town. Everything changes. So how do you live self-controlled? Well, that's part of fighting those worldly passions. You're, you're, you're not just fighting them, but you're replacing them. You know, because you can, you ever notice that you can remove something, but if it's not replaced, you either leave a vacuum or that thing is just going to come right back. Have you ever tried to dig a hole in, in water? Never? Am I just the only dummy that does that? But yeah, you do it. You dig a hole in water, and guess what? Comes right back, doesn't it? So what do you have to do? You have to grab your bucket and stick it down there and hold it down. Now there's no water in that space anymore because there's a bucket there. But if I were to take that bucket out of there, what happens? Water comes right back. And let me tell you something. If you're not at war with the, your fleshly passions, your worldly passions, with your lusts, with your selfish ambitions, with your covetousness, with your grudges, if you're not at, work, at war with your unforgiveness, guess what? Just like water, it comes back. So you have to replace it with something else. You have to replace it with these things, with self-control. You have to replace it with self-control. You have to replace it with righteousness, being upright. And you have to replace it. Woo! with godly living. So what he does with his self-control, he's talking about our inner, our inner life, our thought life, our desires, our affections, and the way that we think. So it's training us to change those things on the inside. It's also to live uprightly, is to live rightly in relationship to other people. So our relationships to other people, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, husbands to their wives, wives to their husbands, children to their parents, parents to their children, fathers to their children. Our relationship with God is changed. Our relationship with the people that work, you know, the people that we work for, like, we're, like we could say slaves. We're not, we're not supposed to steal from our bosses. We're not supposed to take time off when we haven't asked for it. We're not supposed to pinch a pencil or steal staples. We're just, we're, our relationship is changed. All those relationships are changed. I live rightly in every relationship that I can because why? Because, because grace has saved me and grace has trained me to do that. And then it's training me just to live a godly life, dependent on God. When I hear that word godly, it reminds me that the very first lesson that we learn about humanity in the book of Genesis is this. We were created to be the image bearers of God. And that purpose has never, never stopped. Jesus personified God completely as the image of God in person form, in human form. 
And when scriptures challenge us to live godly lives, the example is Jesus. You can do WWJD or whatever you got to do. But when we're challenged to live godly lives, we're challenged to live as if Jesus, as, as Jesus did. Self-control, upright, godly. We say no to the way that we used to be. We say no to ungodliness and we say yes to godliness. In the Greek, it's asabeia and usabeia. I don't want to bore you with that, but I just like the way it sounds. I don't really know exactly what it means, but asabeia and usabeia. And usabeia is the good beia, whatever the bad beia is, the asabeia, but usabeia is the good beia. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present. So this training grace, teaching us how not to live and teaching us how to live, but this training grace adds something else to us, verse 13. Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope. This blessed hope. Now this is interesting because sometimes when we think of hope here, we're like, oh, I hope it doesn't rain Saturday so I can go fishing, right? Or, oh, I sure hope I get that new toy for Christmas. Or, I heard Billy's cancer's come back. Oh, I hope not. We use hope in so many different ways, right? Hope so, hope not, you know. But here, this. This isn't some just, you know, magic wish. This is this is certainty. This is, I have hope. Because of something, I have hope. And what's the hope? Oh, it says it right here. You ready? Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God. Wow. The blessed hope that we depend on, that we base our lives on, that we base our, our hope on, our future on, is, is, is the fact that there's something happening in the future. There, there will be an appearing, another appearing. Because remember, the grace of God has already appeared. Oh, but there's, a, there's something else to be experienced. There's the, the, the glory of God will appear. The glory of God will appear. Just, ladies and gentlemen, just like Jesus Christ is God's grace in person form, Jesus Christ is also God's glory in the form of a person. We have seen God's grace. Jesus Christ came. He lived. He died on the cross. He was buried. He was resurrected. That's God's grace appearing for us to save us. But then, verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, we're not only being trained, but we're also being motivated and moved and encouraged. I'll just give you an example. I have a, I, I, I run. I know you can't tell it, but I do. I don't do it well and I don't do it fast, but I run. And I don't do it because I enjoy it. I don't. In fact, every three months I have to go get a shot in my knee so that I can continue to torture myself on the streets of Arlington. But during the winter and when during the rainy season, I have a treadmill. And the fact that I have that treadmill does not get my running done for me. I have to have some kind of motive, something to motivate me to, to pull it out of the corner, lower it, plug it in, turn it on, hop on it, and run in place for 30 minutes. I got to have motivation. Because if I don't, if nothing's motivating me to get on that thing, guess what? It becomes a coat hanger, right? It just sits there, gets dusty, and holds clothes. So I have to have motivation. Just because I have the ability to do something doesn't mean that it gets done. Ability doesn't always get things done. It's like I tell my daughter, talent, <laughs> hard work beats talent when talent don't work hard, right? Because she's trying to do gymnastics and she gets upset because some of the other girls can do things she can't do. And I said, honey, work hard. Because work hard will beat talent when talent don't work hard. And just because something can be done, just because I have the ability to do something doesn't mean I'm going to do it. I have to have something internal to me to motivate me to get up and do that thing, which I can do. So here's the deal. Grace has appeared to save us and is training us. It's giving us the ability to do things, to live a godly life. 
God is giving us the ability through the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, the ability to, to fulfill what he created us for, which is to be his image bearer on earth. We can now fulfill the demands what God wants for us. We can be obedient to him in a way that we could not be before salvation. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit being poured upon us. God has come to save us and God has come to train us. And God has come to motivate us. God has come to move us. He is, hang, he, is, he is pointing us to something that is going to happen in the future. There's a day, there's a day, brothers and sisters, there's a day coming when Jesus Christ will appear in his glory. The last time the world saw him, he was in his glory, right? He was bloody, he was beaten, he almost did not look like a human. He could not be recognized. But when he comes back, oh, do you know what's going to happen when he comes back? I do. I read the book. When he comes back, ladies and gentlemen, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess like they've been in church all their lives that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. But here's the thing, not everyone who bows their knee and confesses with their tongue is doing it from a point of salvation. Because you know, one of the things the scripture teaches us that everybody's going to be resurrected that's died. Not just believers, everybody. And everybody's going to get one of these awesome bodies that lasts forever and doesn't wear out. You know what? Some of us are going to go to heaven and then be able to enjoy God forever in those awesome bodies that will never wear out. But some people are going to go to hell in those awesome bodies that never wear out. They will be always dying, but never dying. And therefore, brothers and sisters, we must keep our eyes on the prize. There's coming a day when Jesus is coming back and the glory of God will be revealed. There was a foretaste of it on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John see Jesus speaking with Moses and Elijah and they said, oh, this is cool. Let's hang out here. But that was just a taste. Just a taste of what's going to happen when Jesus comes back in all his glory, very visibly, in such a way that everybody's going to know it. I don't know how. I don't know if the earth's going to do this. I don't know what's going to happen. But somehow everybody's going to know that Jesus is back. Very visibly, very audibly. And we're going to see his glory. And so what, what Paul tells us is the Holy Spirit is training believers who have been saved. Is training us to live a certain way, to say no to certain things, to say yes to certain things, and to wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. To wait. Now, this isn't just we sit on our couch, twiddle our thumbs, and watch Netflix. That's not how we're supposed to spend our wait. The wait is where the zeal comes in. You know what I'm saying? The waiting is where the zealousness happens. As we're waiting for God to return in the person of Jesus Christ, as we're waiting for God's Son to appear as the reigning King as we're waiting on that, we, work, we wait in zeal. We wait in zeal. That's what the Holy Spirit is training us to do. That's what grace is training us to do, to be zealous for good works as we wait. It's training us how we wait. We wait from a position of salvation. We wait from a position of it's done. We, 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 are, we are assured this is happening. That is our hope. And because that is our hope, we are zealous. That's how it all plugs in together. So we wait. We wait for his appearance and then look what it says here. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. It's interesting. Turn over to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 with me real quick. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, excuse me. I got excited. I jumped over too many pages. 2 Timothy, one page over. First Timothy chapter 4, I mean 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. I'll get it right in a minute. Henceforth, it says, well, let me go to verse 7. I love this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, 
there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. That day we were just talking about? That day when he comes back? The righteous judge will award me on that day. And not only to me, Paul says, but to all who have loved his appearing. You know, one of the things that's supposed to be, um, be evident in, in the Christian church in a Christian person's heart is that he, when he thinks about Jesus coming back, he loves him dearly, dearly. I, but I'm afraid that the church nowadays, we're so comfortable, we are so dull and deadened by our entertainments. We're no longer zealous. And we probably go most days not even thinking about Maranatha come. Come, Lord Jesus. See, you see what grace teaches us and trains us to do is to wait zealously and to long for that day. We're to long for the return of the King. Man. But that's not the only place you see that. If you turn over to, to Hebrews. I'm testing my uh, Bible drill skills now because I'm trying to remember exactly where that one was, but it's coming to my mind. Because that's what happens when you, when you freestyle a little bit. But there's a verse in Hebrews that says the same thing. That we are to long for the appearing of Christ. And I'll have to be honest with you that I don't feel that every day. I don't wake up zealous. And I don't wake up for longing. I wake up completely preoccupied or zealous about other things. And you know what I have to do? I have to confess that. I'm doing it to you. But I also have to do that to the Lord. I have to confess that a lot of times I'm not relying on my training. I am not focused on the prize. I'm not longing for the return. I'm not resting in my hope. And so one of the things I want to challenge you, if that's you today... If you're one of those who claims to have received the salvation that comes only by grace through faith, and you have this same struggle, I want to offer you the cure. We have to constantly go to the cross. Because that's where Paul took us. Did y'all catch that? He challenges us with all this great stuff and then he takes us right back to the cross. Verse 14, who gave himself for us. He goes right back to the cross. On those days when you wake up and you're focused on other things. On those days when you wake up when you're numb to the fact that Jesus is ruling and reigning and training. When you're numb to that. When you're, when you're, when you're being tolerant of sin in your own heart. Where do we go? We go to the cross. We go to the cross. Because like Paul told us in Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loving me gave himself for me. We go back to the cross because it's there that we're reminded that should have been me. Should have been you. 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 That should have been you on the cross, but it wasn't because there was a great one hanging in your place. And so those days when, when the things of heaven and the hope of Christ seem so far away, I have to go back to the cross. And I have to remember that the great one who is coming again the perfect one, the sinless one. He received, he paid my penalty. He lived out my sentence. 
and that I will be for all, all eternity in his presence forever. That's where we get our hope. That's where we get our zeal. We have to constantly go back to the cross, preach to ourselves the gospel, preach to one another about the gospel. Remind yourself you are a dirty sinner. You are a rebel against God. You committed treason against God and you deserve the cross. But by the grace of God, I am saved and I am brought in and I am changed and everything about my life is new. As Paul said, I am a new creature. The old things have passed away and the new things have come. Brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with that. It's the gospel. The reason why I believe that grace will save, the grace that saved me is the grace that will train me is because of what happened on the cross. The express reason that Christ died for me was that he would save me and then he would change me. That's the reason I was saved so that he could change me into an image bearer of God. So I could be a person like Christ, zealous to do the will of the Father. And so I believe that is true for me, and I believe that is true for you, and I believe that is true for this church. The reason Christ died was to make you into a people who are zealous for the good works that bring glory to God. Now, as we move into the time of invitation, I want to, that's the, the offer I want to offer to you today. Have you, have you received this grace? Have you experienced this grace? Have, has grace changed you? Has it entered into your life? Because the, t the testimony of Scripture is if grace has entered in, grace doesn't leave us unchanged. And so here's my challenge to everyone here. If you have made a profession of faith, if you've been baptized, if you've joined the church, but, but as you look at your life, you don't see any evidence, you don't see any fruit of grace in your life, I want to ask you today, swallow that pride and declare before this people, I need that grace. And the, scriptures, the scriptures give us this promise that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All. All who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation will be saved. That, my friends, is good news. I don't care how bad you are. That is good news. And some of you today are just struggling in your faith. Maybe you're just trying to get by. Maybe, as she talked about, we're staring at the storm instead of God. We're focused. We're so focused on our sin, maybe. Maybe we hate our sin, but we're just so focused on it that it looks like a giant, and I feel like a grasshopper. Maybe we're just so focused on the wrong things. Maybe you just need to be reminded to turn your eyes. Jesus. That's for everybody. Turn your eyes to Jesus today. As I don't know what you're going to sing, but whatever it is, I'm sure it's going to be good.